Well, thank you, Roland. Uh, and thanks to uh, anyone who's helped to organize this symposium, um, a meeting like this. It's really great, and, and it's important for the continued advancement of our field. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry I'm not Josh. So <laughs> nobody walk out, please. That would really hurt my feelings. You know, um, no, yeah, Josh is sorry as well that some things came up and he just couldn't be here today. Um, but he still wanted to be a part of this meeting, and so we still wanted to give this talk um, <laughs> because he values the importance of, of, of the research and stuff that you, know, you guys are doing. Um, and so the good news is, is that this is Josh, Josh's work. This is his talk. And so all the information that you'll see in the slides um, and anything message-wise that I'm trying to convey to you, it's really Josh's message. So, so if you have any issues, take it up with him. No. <laughs> um, so well, what that message is, um, is like Dylan, or like, uh, sorry, like Roland uh, highlighted, it's the, the, the value of movement data when it's applied to management issues. Um, and so that's what we're going to discuss today, as I'm really going to take a step back from all the theory and methods that have probably bogged you guys down over the last couple of days. And let's have a little more relaxing morning here, and let's look at some examples um, of ways in which movement data have been really valuable to addressing conservation issues. Uh, before we get in, a lot of the stuff you're going to see in this talk is the result of hard work from many of Josh's graduate students, postdocs, and even undergraduates. Um, there's a whole list of names up here, and I'm not going to read through all those names. Um, I will try to drop some names as I go through the material um, it, with, when possible. But I do want to call out a couple people in general that were actually here and participated in this symposium. Chris Rhoda was here, and I think he gave a workshop and maybe a talk. Um, and then Dave Jahowski is also here and gave some talk on elephants, and I'll cover some of his material today. So those are two people you might want to keep an eye on. Okay, so as I mentioned, Today I'm going to give a talk about species ranging from hellbenders, as you see in the slide or the photo here, to <laughs> elephants. And movement data have the ability to address far-ranging questions, and they offer a key component of addressing pressing management issues. Movement data become particularly powerful when they're combined with other data, like species success or habitat data. And in general, movement data are the great integrator because they combine internal and external factors in addition to species-specific motion navigation. You guys have all seen this, this, this uh, figure here from Nathan et al. And what it does is it provides an integrated view of how wildlife use landscapes. And this, this, this view and this knowledge then uh, is important in many applications of movement data um, and it ranges, we can, we, it, those applications range from um, estimating the, the probability of occurrence to risk assessments to habitat management. Increasingly, movement data are combined with advanced statistical models that allow a deeper insight. Uh, today, though, we're going to step away from those statistical models and kind of discuss a more general idea of movement data and how it can be applied or how, and how it can be used in an applied context. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to discuss a variety of ongoing, well, completed projects and ongoing projects that Josh has conducted over the years um, that demonstrate that, that application. And so here's a quick outline then of the topics that we're going to discuss. So in, in each of these topics, movement data have been used to address these issues. And so and I'll give some different examples for all of these topics. So let's get started then with, with human-wildlife conflicts. Okay, the first example I want to talk about is our bird strikes. Bird strikes are increasing, and they represent a substantial concern. Okay, there's, there's major concern for human safety. There's a substantial economic cost. There's estimates over one billion worldwide. And many species cause these issues. So, okay, so if we know how wildlife are using airports, then we can help to mitigate these effects through habitat management, for example, or some other means. But we often need more detailed information about flight paths of planes, but also flight paths of birds, right? So here, just to demonstrate this example, here's a, 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 an image of Langley Air Force Base. And what you can see here, um, what you can see here, if I can, there we go, all these red points that are just northeast of the runways at Langley are active osprey nests. So you can see the potential then for some conflicts and some issues and problems. And indeed, 
Yep, there we go. Indeed, that's the case, that there were issues and problems. In fact, the US military uses radar tracking of bird movements to change flight routes. <coughs> and it's actually kind of interesting. The Netherlands Air Force does this tracking of, they use radar to track bird movements in real time to adjust, make those adjustments. And in doing so in real time, it's managed to decrease their bird strikes by 50%. So it's really interesting. Now this is all for military bases. What about for civilian airports, right? Well, one of Josh's former students, Brian Washburn, who's now with USDA APHIS, um, is actually trying to do that. He's monitoring bird <coughs> movements on airports, and they're using GPS PTTs to monitor and to obtain X, Y, and Z data on these airports for a variety of species. And here's an example of the type of data that we might get from, from, that, from that effort. You can see how it's in relation to the airport there. So what do we do with that data? Well, there are multiple ways to analyze such data, right? You could take a, you know, do a, a frequency, a relative frequency of Z values, which will give you, you know, an indication of the Z, but it leaves out the X and Y, right? You could do a bivariate kernel on the X and Y, but you don't know what about the Z, right? Well, what we've been doing is we've been doing some work to, to estimate trivariate kernels that combine both the X, Y, and Z. So that way, if we know flight paths of planes, which we often do, right? We know, we know where the planes are going. And if we can estimate that trivariate kernel function associated with bird movements, then we have an opportunity to evaluate, the, to evaluate in a probabilistic sense um, the, the probability of, of, of those two and the issues associated with them. And if, we know, and if we have that information, then we can offer some mitigating actions like making slight changes to flight paths or timing. So there's also been some, some other creative ways of dealing with human-wildlife conflicts. Um, the development of sensory and biological deterrence is on the rise. Here's an example of using honeybees to deter elephant crop raiding. So they literally put these, these these honeybee hives along fence lines to deter elephants. And, and that's actually, that's even profitable, right? So if you're in the area, you can even stop by and buy some elephant-friendly honey, you know? Uh, but, there are, but another example involves the use of virtual fences that send alerts when animals cross a geo-boundary. And Dave Jahowski um, explored some of this, and basically the, the concept is that if you have marked elephants and you're monitoring their movements and, and, and they've crossed a geo-reference boundary somehow, then management can be alerted in real time and can respond to that issue um, and really, really decrease the likelihood of conflicts. So that's really interesting. And that idea of, of monitoring and managing and responding in real time can even be extended then to bird movements. So on wind farms, if we have knowledge of bird movements either through radar or through tracking, for example, for eagles for, uh, is a good example, then as we monitor a potential for conflict with an eagle near a wind farm, we can turn off and on those turbines in real time. Um, so there's definitely some potential there. So spatial scale management. That sounds a little vague. What am I talking about? Well, I hope the next couple examples will kind of illustrate what I mean when I discuss, you know, how movement data is using, uh, we're using movement data to identify spatial scale of management. And the first example deals with sage grouse. You know, they're warranted but precluded from the endangered species list. So there's obviously some concern with them. And it, this concern st stems from the fact that in their management, winter concentration areas are critically important, and especially given that these areas are also f in conflict with oil and gas development. So then the question arises then is, what are these areas, what are actually these winter concentration areas so that way we can protect them? What are their boundaries? What do they look like? Um, so Josh was asked to chair a panel in Wyoming that was asked to identify the methods used to delineate these winter concentration areas. And they were given a bunch of data, uh, an assortment of data, and it be quickly became obvious to them that combining movement and animal observation data with habitat data was definitely the best, um, the best method and approach for going forward. And so they developed a resource selection function that linked animal data 
to identify spatial bounds where management should be directed to identify those winter conservation areas. Previously, they had just used arbitrary buffers of 500 meters around observation points. But you can see in, from this image then, this resulted in a loss of high qual quality habitat being protected. But by combining the movement data with that resource selection information, they're able to have a much more robust um, estimate of where those winter conservation, concentration areas should be. Another example is the delineation of elk unit boundaries. You know, so a lot of work has been done, and we know that many elk organize their into, into spatially distinct herds. And this is actually kind of nice because it facilitates uh, management by identifying where distinct, distinct groups reside. So you can plan your management boundaries around those dis the distinct groups. Now, here's something you may not have known. Many states have a commercial turtle harvest. That's right. On rivers like the Missouri River, individuals and businesses can go out there and harvest soft-shell turtles and snapping turtles with no bag limit and no size limit. The problem is, is that many agencies like the Missouri Department of Conservation know very little about turtle movements and turtle ecology, so they have no way to set the spatial scale of management and harvest. Movement data are going to be the first step to doing that. Identifying the movements of these turtles will allow these agencies then to start to better regulate and estimate their harvest. You learn something new every day, right? So now I'm going to show you a few examples then of resource selection and habitat management. And the first example I want to talk about are blackback woodpeckers. And Chris may have discussed blackback woodpeckers in his talk, I'm not for sure. Um, but blackback woodpeckers or a borealis or mon montane um, woodpecker. And there's a lot of concern um, for the species. Actually, they're just currently petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. And that concern stems from the fact that their habitats that they're associated with, and in some cases even depend on, are recently disturbed forests. Forests that have been burned by wildfire, or forests that are suffering from mountain pine beetle infestation. And the reason is because of all the dead trees, that it, 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 um, those dead trees recruit in a bunch of wood boring beetles and other insects that are great food resources for these birds. Okay, so you can see the concern then because these kind of forests are not too desirable from a public standpoint or a timber industry standpoint. So there's obviously a conflict. So we need to identify the relative importance of these forests compared to with other forests, right? And so what Chris Rhoda did then for his PhD was he asked the question, and this is in the Black Hills, he asked the question, which type of habitat is most important for these birds? And he looked at those, those, those forests following wildfire. He looked at mountain pine beetle infestation. But then in the Black Hills, they also use prescribed fire because it's easier to control, and they're hoping that it can create some habitat for these birds in, in a more publicly desirable manner. So he went out to these areas, and he trapped blackback woodpeckers, he attached transmitters, and he tracked these guys through the season. And then just when those transmitters were about to die, he trapped the poor guys again and put more transmitters on them. So we've got a really great data set then on these species about and how they use these habitats across an entire year. Uh, and what he was able to do then was he was able to monitor the movements and the demographics of the woodpeckers in these different habitats. He was able to get specific information like nest survival, adult and juvenile survivals, um, as well as reproductive information too. And when you have all that information, it's habitat specific, then you can put that into a population dynamics framework and you can create population models that are specific to habitats so you can estimate what the growth rates are in these habitats. That's a key insight into how important those habitats are to the overall population, right? And so here's what he found. This graph shows the, the population growth rate, the posterior densities of the population growth rates. And so what I want you to pull away from this graph is that while the wildfire habitat was actually, was actually the most important, right? It was actually had a lambda, which is a, a lambda, which is the growth rate above one, which indicates that that population was growing. And that was followed by mountain pine beetle infestations that were, uh, that unfortunately were not as suitable. But interestingly enough, the prescribed fire habitat provided the worst habitat into the, in terms of the population growth rate. And this was really due to the survival issue that I won't get into. But you can see what the movement data and, and, and that information tracking those birds was able to, to give us in terms of insight into this question about what habitat is most important. This was a, this was a really key find um, 
for this for this species. And just a little bit of movement information related to black backed woodpeckers. This is actually kind of interesting. This is um, this, these are home range estimates for the black backed woodpeckers in these different habitats. So we've got wildfire, we've got prescribed fire here, and then mountain pine beetle infestations. And this is just interesting because it corroborates what that previous slide showed you that in wildfire and also in prescribed fire, right after the fire when resources are most abundant, it's when we see the smallest home ranges, right? They have everything they need. But as those fire systems degrade over time, as the wood starts to degrade and the food leaves those areas, you can see that the home ranges start to increase, right? Because resources are not as abundant anymore. So that's kind of an interesting find. All right, so it's also related to habitat management. Species conflicts through habitat restoration are rare, except one particular case in the Wachita Mountains in Arkansas. Okay, there, there's an emphasis on restoring red cockaded woodpecker habitat. Okay, and this, this emphasis on red cockaded woodpecker management uh, really focuses on the creation of pine blue stem, this pine blue stem ecosystem, in which the managers try to keep the canopies open, keep virtually no mid-story, and in, in implement that blue stem grass, grass um, in the bottom. So you can see how open this is. And in doing, and in doing all this, they, they have to increase the harvest rotation from 70 to 120 years because they want bigger, larger, more bigger, larger trees, right, in a more open canopy. Well, the problem is that Eastern spotted skunks are also a species of concern in this environment. Uh, their numbers have declined precipitously over the last 80 years. And given this precarious status, then the obvious question was, how are the, what, what's their response to the restoration associated with red cockaded woodpeckers? So Josh's student at the time, Damon Lesmeister, radio tagged spotted skunks and monitored their movements. And he determined that they keyed in on very dense cover in very large, uh, <coughs> excuse me, very large forest patches that were less than 30 years old. Okay, and this pattern of occurrence was striking. Here, if you, if you look at this, you, this is a utilization distribution draped over a GIS layer. And you can see how the boundary of that home range for that particular skunk overlaps almost perfectly with that patch of uh, early shortleaf pine habitat. You know, so the thing to realize is that this is in direct conflict with red cockaded woodpecker habitat management, all right? And the skunk selection for this early dense forest cover is likely related to um, predator avoidance, okay? Many of these skunk, or this actual population that was monitored, had a survival rate of 35%. It was quite low, and much of the mortality was associated with avian predation in those open habitats. So you can see how there is a direct, you can see the conflict then between eastern spotted skunk habitat and what they need for their populations and the restoration work going on with red cockaded woodpeckers. And so this movement work then highlighted the critical conflicts that can arise when you promote habitat for one species. In particular, it suggests that the, the importance then of creating a mosaic of forests in this environment, right? So what about corridor identification and management? So everyone has heard of the famous African big game migrations in the Serengeti and the incredible bird migrations um, that cross continental boundaries, right? Some of the best known large mammal migrations in the United States occur within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, including long distance migrations by pronghorn. These pronghorn migrations re, um, in the region have generated a lot of interest given their conflicts with human development. Often animal data, animal movement data, are the critical piece of information necessary to identify the timing and location <laughs> of these migrations so that management can focus on those areas and directly, um, and directly address any potential threats or any other activities. Movement data, in this case, are the most reliable data source. But there are also other migrations routes that are less popularized, uh, but just as important to local populations uh, 
of migratory animals. Jesse Kohler identified these pronghorn migration routes in southwest North Dakota. So in this case, the use of animal data and movement data made it possible to evaluate where those exist so that future development and activities can be appropriately managed. And there are also other species, such as sage grouse, that you typically might not think of when you think of migrations. But as technology advances, we're able to get more information on the movements of species like these, so that way we can start to look at the timing and existence of migrations in these kinds of species. <coughs> Excuse me. So animal movement data are commonly used in animal translocation studies. The first example I want to talk about are hellbenders. They're a long-lived, fully aquatic, nocturnal salamander, and there's a lot of conservation concerns surrounding this species. They were extensively studied in, in Missouri in the 1980s, but since then we have seen precipitous declines um, in the species over the last, 70, or last 20 years. There's been an over 70% decline over the last 20 years. Now, there are lots of reasons why, hell, why hellbender numbers are declining, and there's also a lot of interest in trying to rear uh, hellbenders in a captive setting and release them to bolster the population. So Josh and his student at the time, Kathy bodenoff jahowski teamed up with the Missouri Department of Conservation and the St. Louis Zoo to monitor released hellbenders. So they implanted these hellbenders with transmitters um, with lifespans of seven to, to, to 15 months. And, and prior to release, they implanted them. And then after release, well, they released them at two separate sites and then monitored them very carefully and closely after release, every 32 hours or so. And here's one of the things they found related to movements, that, that, that there were basically three dispersal patterns. The first were the non-dispersers. You can see here the different movements of these individual salamanders. So they essentially didn't go very far. But there were also the slow and steady kind and an abrupt long distance disperser that basically took off after they were released and moved quite a long distance. So we've got those three dispersal patterns. The interesting thing was that if you look at the dispersal distance in the direction, we see that more long distance dispersal occurred on this upper site. I can't quite reach that one. Um, on this upper site. In fact, at the upper site, we observed dispersal events that were more variable and twice as long. So this was due to the availability of quality habitat at these sites. When animals were located in areas with high quality boulder habitat, they stuck around. <coughs> you can see that here between the two sites. So if you want to minimize dispersal then, you need to key in on the right quality habitat, which includes those boulders, but also bedrock and large crevices. And it's important to key in on, what Kathy found was it was important to key on, in on these at a very fine scale. Even distances of greater than two meters from these kind of features uh, was too far. These individuals that stuck around, they literally stuck around under the same rock. So it was really interesting. So let's go to the opposite, um, opposite extreme and look at elephants. And so nearly removed from South Africa in the 1890s, uh, elephants have been reintroduced to over, to over 50 reserves over the past three decades. Now, we've been interested in the movement of these elephants in their South African reserves, and more specifically, we're interested in the, in, in, a, in the relationship between movements and their physiological stress. And this is why, and, and the reason is because there was a lot of aberrant behavior in elephants, young, especially young male elephants. Um, we had even cases of elephants charging and killing rhinos. So colleagues in South Africa have been monitoring these elephants through radio tracking and individual identification. And the question was how were elephants 
that were stressed responding to their environment. So they knew which ones were stressed. So could movements tell them something about how they were re uh, interacting with that environment? Well, Josh and Dave, Dis D Dave Jahowski integrated the two, and here's what they found. And I'm sure, Dave, you've probably discussed some of this in your talk already, so I won't go into great detail. Uh, but basically, the, the, the movement patterns of elk, or sorry, elk, of elephants changed uh, drastically depending on whether they were in an elevated physiological stress state. So whether it was distances from water, refugia, uh, distances from certain boundaries, those patterns were different depending on whether they were, uh, their stress was elevated versus whether they were just at a, at a basal stress level. And one thing in particular was that the stressed elephants in a sense essentially streaked through their environment and through the landscape and had much more directed movements to refugia. So this kind of result then highlights the importance of refugia <laughs> and it also highlights how visibility of elephants can be changed, can change uh, in relation to ecotourism, for example. So there are a lot of reasons why we care about species interaction, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples. First, the first one relates to ungulate stocking rates. Lots of ungulates means lots of forage eaten, which can degrade, you know, which can degrade environments, um, and et cetera. This is certainly the case for Custer State Park in South Dakota, where, the, where there exists, coexist six different types of ungulates within park boundaries. So this image here shows the highest probability of occurrence and an overlap index in the park. And it illustrates where the problems uh, and conflicts could occur between individuals. Knowing where these areas of high overlap occur allow us to monitor and mitigate impacts. If in some of these managed systems like Custer, we can modify movements of animals like bison simply by opening and closing gates. So this information gives us um, a huge potential in terms of managing amongst all those species. Chronic wasting disease is another, another great example of, deer in, or of species interactions. Here, chronic wasting disease is a big deal right now. And Josh has been looking, developing camera technology to monitor animal interactions and movements. And that's because for this disease, contact rates and dispersal and distances um, or distances moved are important to its spread. So Josh is using an integrated sensor system that combines GPS, video, audio, accelerometers, and it integrates all this information then to give us a picture of contact rates. And so in the process of reviewing this information for what they were, what they were beginning to do, they found out that actually these kinds of systems have been used extensively on other species for a while now. But they are moving forward, and they, and they have gotten some estimates of contact rates. And so this information, along with distances moved, can be incorporated into the CWD models, and then it begins to tell us something about the disease spread, such as the distances, maximum distances moved, or how the disease will move across a landscape. All right. Um, so last, I want to talk about the use of movement data to address development. And I'm primar primarily talking about energy development. So this is a huge issue and impacts many species. Everything from sage grouse to songbirds. <laughs> and so for the first example, I know you wouldn't usually think of North Dakota when you think of any kind of development. Um, but, but there is development going on there, quite a bit actually. Uh, here's, here's a great, great image. I love this image. So you've all, you're familiar with these images of, of the continent at night, right, in, in, the, in the light disturbance. But what's this up here? What's up, what's up there? That's obviously not a metropolis in North Dakota. <laughs> no, it's, it's the Bakken Shale Formation, right? And that is, that, that is quite a disturbance. What is that? It, you, you, your first thought is you would think that that's lighting and associated with the infrastructure or the facilities or so on. No, it's not. 
It's flaring off of natural gas from the wells. Yeah, yeah. And so my point is with this is that, is that there is a lot of development and a lot of changes happening up there in North Dakota. This image is quite, quite illustrating. This is, this is a, a depiction in some article that basically said that Williston, North Dakota is the, the fastest growing city in the U.S. Over, over the recent past, it's seen property values go up by 300, over 300 percent. It's seen rent go up to $2,400. Rent in North Dakota at $2,400? Okay, it's not, too, uh, it's, it's not too far of an extreme then to, to, to see this in North Dakota then. You literally are seeing residents that are being displaced with that kind of change in the economy. So if you've got resident people in North Dakota being displaced, and literally living in the Walmart parking lot. What does that mean for something like mule deer, right? And the issue is that, you know, mule deer are a great example of this because their range overlaps with a lot of proposed oil and gas development in North Dakota. And the problem is that managers have no idea how this kind of development is going to interact or affect mule deer. You know, just, just at the start of, in the speculation of this, we would think that there would obviously be direct effects, right? As infrastructure are, is, is put in place, as roads and wells and facilities are put in there, you're going to see habitat loss, right? But also, there's likely going to be indirect effects related to the disturbance in general. Mule deer are likely going to avoid these areas because they're being disturbed, so they're going to avoid a larger area. So with those, the potential for all these kinds of effects, there's a need then to monitor the movements and the demographics of these mule deer in relation to this development. And the idea is that if we can identify that, then we can identify some mitigation techniques. So Jesse Kolar is teaming back up again with Josh Millspaw, and this is actually what they're, they're just now starting up. So this will be Jesse's PhD work in, in North Dakota. And they're going to try to identify mitigation techniques for this kind of development. There's, there's no stopping this development, right? So we need to identify mitigation techniques. Okay, and so my last example then um, today uh, is another really interesting example. This is, uh, this, and it deals with sage grouse and wind energy development. This is a really hot topic right now. Um, it's, you know, even people up as high as the president are, are talking about this stuff. And at the center of this, in addition to sage grouse, is the power company of Wyoming. The power company of Wyoming is proposing to build a 1,000 turbine, 2 to 3,000 megawatt wind energy, wind energy facility. This will be the largest wind farm in North America. Now, the setting for this wind farm will be smack dab in the middle of the sagebrush, ste sagebrush steppe ecosystem and sage grouse habitat. So, Josh and others are working with the power company actually to research sage grouse ecology prior to construction. So that way they can, order to, they can help mitigate and identify some conservation actions, actions once construction starts. And this is really a kind of really advantageous and a great thing because by starting early like this, they can use that before, after, control impact design that will really give them some robust estimates of the effects of this, of this development. And so sage grouse movements are going to be the key component. And here are some of those here are some of the mer metrics that we're already starting to evaluate. Site fidelity, migration routes, lek attendance and transitions, stochastic movement models, resource selection models. Let me just quickly go through a few, a few of these examples. For site fidelity, we're looking to see if sage grouse currently shift their space use across seasons and years. This will be important to know when we go to evaluate the effects of development. So you can see here that's the park boundary and here's some of the early estimates, um, UD estimates, for this is an individual sage grouse during nesting and post nesting. And so indeed we see some differences. They're also using PTT devices to model movement stochastically to acquire a detailed accounting of how birds use the landscape. You can see in this image here that we've generated that we've got some proposed wind, wind turbines and you can see these, you may not see it very well, but those are actual arrow, arrows that indicate the magnitude and the direction of movements in that boundary, in that home range. Now I've already mentioned how we're identifying corridors through the use of GPS tags was something that was kind of interesting to us and we didn't realize the importance of coming into this. 
And we're incorporating movement data into uh, multi-state mark recapture models to estimate lek attendance and movement probabilities among leks. And finally, we're integrating movement data with resource layers to examine resource selection at multiple scales over time. So all this information that we're collecting now, once construction sh starts, we'll have a baseline then to compare what the actual impacts are. It's rare to actually have those cases um, at this kind of scale um, for a species that's this important. So I hope these examples illustrate the tremendous value in animal movement data for addressing conservation issues. They're often the core data set for everything from hellbenders to elephants. But power is really achieved when you combine animal movement data with other information. And we obviously need to keep developing statistical methods to understand these data and, and to make inferences from these data. But I would also add in one last point that we also, there is also a tremendous need to make these techniques accessible and available, and that's usually upon us. Okay? If we're developing these te techniques, we need to make them available so that others can use them. Josh wanted to really, um, it's really important to him that he acknowledges all the people that he's collaborated with and that have helped funded all of this research um, over the past few years. And with that, I'll take any questions um, and answer them as best I can. Great, thanks. That was that was a whirlwind of, of, uh, of projects around the world. Really cool. Uh, uh, any any questions? No, no idea, unfortunately. Grouse, the grouse ecology is very difficult to pick apart because um, they're not doing very well. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, with their ecosystem that they're in. Sagebrush ecosystems are very hard to manage habitat-wise. Um, and there are a lot of factors that are affecting the demographics and the resource selection. So it's not one of those smoking gun, let's find it and fix it. This is going to be a difficult one. So we, uh, but in, if you ask me in terms of if we have any idea of how they're going to fare, I don't have any idea right now. Yeah. They're being shipped to China. Yep. They're shipped overseas to China. So that's, there's a huge market. I don't think so. I haven't heard of anything domestic. I know I come from Missouri. I know we eat snapping turtle. So, but that's by no means taken having the impact that, you know, this is. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about how you incorporate kind of precautionary principles and, and what you don't know and how you use kind of mitigation techniques with the animal development and how they respond to that, you know, they push hard on the data or sort of what they can accommodate kind of some of those natural resources and blah blah. Oh, sorry, yeah. So, so so your question was expand a little bit more on the precautionary I idea. So is that coming from the precautionary idea from, from the development's perspective or our perspective? Well, our perspective as wildlife ecologists and, and you know, but that's what we don't necessarily know. But right, so, so the question then was, you know, what about the, you know, how much are we trying to address the idea of what we don't know about these species in relation to energy development? That is key. That, that, that is, that's what we're doing and why we're out there doing that is because oftentimes we don't have that baseline information about movements or demographics or anything, so how can you assess any kind of effect? And that's not going to hold up in a court of law either, you know, whenever it comes time to implement management or regulate these, this kind of development. You need that control before or after. And so it's key then in these cases to really get in beforehand, establish what we don't know, or in the case of sage grouse corridors, what we, yeah, we, we know now, but we didn't know before. It was kind of interesting. Um, those kinds of um, data are going to be key. Yeah. Go ahead, back there. So, so that, that's a really good question. Um, his question was, what tools 
um, as movement ecologists, what tools do we need to have available for conservation to use um, to address their issues? You know, that's a good question. I think when I say you know, we need to make these tools and these methods accessible and available, it's we need to try our best once we develop these new technologies and methodologies to analyze data, we need to try our best to distill that to the level that conservation practitioners are going to be able to use it. Whether that means actually providing tools that they can run themselves and use on their own data, or it may not even be that. It may just be we need to process and convey the results in a way that they can take them and use them in management. So if we've conducted an analysis and we've developed, you know, and we've gotten some results related to a certain species, we need to be able to convey that, not just through a scientific journal, but you sit down with the managers and explain to them what this is telling us and what really is key and they need to take home from that. Um, so it's kind of a, a heuristic kind of point, but it's important. Yeah. So following up on that, I hear very often when people are doing data sales, how about making the data available? So if you make data available, people will trust the help. So I, I couldn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. His his point was that we need to make we need to make um, and we, we need to make the tools available, sure, but how about also making the data available, right? A lot of the data, I understand your point, a lot of the data is sitting with those managers that work with those, those animals every day. And people tend to like to keep a hold of their data, right? But that needs to change. I agree with you completely that we need to move into an area now where people are collaborating and, and, and data is going to be more helpful to the species if it gets into the right hands and people that can use it. It works from both ends, absolutely. So I agree with you completely. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And thanks for the presentation. Um, I see that uh, you've done a bit of work in some of the developing countries around the world, but um, when you get to application and management, and you're thinking about land use planning and projecting how to prevent potential conflict or, or uh, conservation impacts, have, have you and have, have the lab how to get this information out to the developing countries who are way behind technologically, way behind from an infrastructure and from the ability to do the work, to think about how to maybe help them think through some of these issues in a, in a progressive way that prevents problems rather than trying to mitigate them later? Right. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So he was asking that in these developing countries where they may not have the means and ability to implement the kinds of management actions required to mitigate these conservation issues, what, what's our approach? How do we get that to developing countries so that they can then take those actions? Um, so I would respond by saying that's where we're going to really rely on collaborators. You know, in, these, in, these, um, in some of the elephant work, um, you know, in Plonsberg um, Reserve and so on, um, people like Rob Sloto, academics over there in these countries that are associated with the reserves are key. But also, I would, in some of my own work, I would, I would put a plug in for a lot of the frameworks out there that we don't typically think of. We conduct research, but there is an incredible industry of conservation being put on the ground out there. Nature conservancies, World Wildlife Fund, these kinds of places, they are starving for this information, and they have the ability and the means to put it in place. Um, so it, 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 I think it really falls on finding your collaborators, finding the people to work with that have the ability to put that in place in those kinds of countries. Um, in, the case of the, yeah, in, ca in the case of Africa, you know, th these were s reserve managers that were, had the ability to do this and they were ready to do it. You know. yeah, I guess just a follow-up suggestion is to consider you setting up sort of a network where you would have your World Wildlife Fund, your IUCN, or other international organizations who are implementing in these countries. If you had any way to transfer that knowledge that of how to proceed, if there's any way to package that and make that distributed to all of the different international partners that are out there implementing and developing in these countries, and it's impacting them, it's, you know, it's invaluable, the, the, the information and knowledge that you've collected and the work that you've all done, and, and how it needs to be transferred to those countries. We have enough of these things. Perhaps a training course or some kind of uh, you know, awareness raising session for you know, the uh, international community that's implementing in multiple countries around the world. Well, you know, it's absolutely right. It, that, that's a great point. And it, that kind of effort, it starts with reaching out. It starts with a phone call to those people at World Wide Life, Life Fund. You know, they're, they're, their hands are full. If we've got stuff that can help, we need to go to them.
Um, and that's and that typically, I, you know, I'm a researcher, so we fall into this trap. We're, 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 as soon as we get done with our research, it's really cool, but what's the next question we want to answer, right? We don't want to follow through and say, well, that answer I just found, how's it, how can it help? So either we need to find people that can help us get that information out, or we need to start taking it upon ourselves to, to get that information out there. So. One, one more question, and then we'll let Tom off the hook. <laughs> okay. Yes. So just a comment on that last question. Uh, Colorado State University uh, is addressing this by partnering with uh, a Wall Street University in Ethiopia and uh, also partnering or working with government uh, bureaus there, uh, training professionals. Well, professionals in Ethiopia don't always have the same background as folks here. So, uh, they're doing exchanges of students, professors, pro uh, professionals in these different bureaus, and uh, we're trying to increase awareness and uh, educate people on both sides of the ocean as to what's going on and how best to address the issues. So, perhaps uh, you know more more partnerships, such as you've suggested, are really helpful. I, I agree. I agree completely. Well, let's thank Tom again for.